In network television programming, the ratings are just about the only game in town, and when the ratings begin to drop, the show is usually on its way out. NBC had a science fiction series on a while back. You probably remember it. It was called Star Trek. After two only... <laughs> Star Trek is... After only two moderately successful seasons, that network decided to drop the program. But for the first time, really, in television history, the outraged TV audience spoke up, and they deluged NBC with approximately a million letters demanding that the show be kept on the air. And they were successful, at least temporarily. And you can take a look at what all the excitement was all about. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. How does that Balkan salute go? That hurts worse than the uniform. In the very first episode of Star Trek, the fans, as you can hear, were wildly loyal. But since it's gone off the air and into reruns, the number of Trekkies has soared and a fantastic cult has developed around the show. Hundreds of thousands of these Trekkies get together at conventions like this one, held last week at the Americana Hotel. It's estimated that 10,000 kids who age from 5 to 50 attended and they besieged the stars of the original show who came to speak with them. Now, these avid fans have come from miles away to hoard the memorabilia of their superheroes. Uh, Queen Satin. Um, Nimoy, but not here. No, I think I made almost everybody except for D-Force Kelly, uh, Mr. Sulu, and Lieutenant O'Hara. Later on, at a costume ball, the fans roared their approval as green witches, blue beings, glitter monsters, and Klingons, Vulcans, and Tribbles paraded by a panel of judges, which included Mr. Chekhov, Chief Engineer Scott, and Captain Kirk, who was incidentally molested by outer space femme fatales no less than a dozen times. The art show dealer's room and hotel lobby swarmed with Trekkies wearing Be Me buttons and Spock t-shirts talking into communicators, and we asked Dr. East to explain. This is where the phaser is stunned, or kill team comes out. Now, this is not a real original phaser. It's just a mock-up, but this is to turn it to make it stun or kill. This is to make it go, and these are the readings it gets. Now, hope you can see the light on this. Oh, yeah. When the last whip-wielding Amazon had passed by the adored and esteemed panel of Star Trek judges, a slimy green crawler named the Hoarder was awarded first prize. But the entry that won an everlasting place in the hearts of all the Trekkies was five-year-old Captain Kirk, who read this log of the United Starship Enterprise. Here it is in the ship's log. Hey, Ladies and gentlemen, the grown-up version of Captain Kirk, William Shatner. Captain, thank you for beaming on to the program. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> now, the, how long has the show been off the air now? I think it's been off five years. Now, how do you... Well, what do you think about the response that... that well, they gave you at that convention, 10,000 people, and, and the packed house here tonight. Uh, you know, I have <clears throat> worked all my life as an actor. I spent years and years in the business. And I can't explain this. <laughs> And so my, my, my uh, experience gives me no, no, uh, no answer. 
Uh, I, I can't put it down to anything but just an incredible phenomena. There are, you may not believe this, a group of intelligent people down there. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Who, um, Blue meanies, Klingons, right? Vulcan. Who are all dressed up as, uh, in some in some aspect of some one of the characters that appeared on uh, on a series that is defunct for five years. I mean, no longer shooting. It has been played again and again and again. I meet people who uh, come up and tell me lines that I've said. You know, uh, I, I by now have forgotten the plot line. I mean, I'll watch a Star Trek now and wonder how it's going to come out. <laughs> I always watch it. I yeah. love it. It's in reruns here yeah. in New York. In New York, it's it. in reruns. It goes off someplace, comes back on. It's really phenomenal. How 10,000 people showed up uh, the day before yesterday, whenever it was, and listened, uh, you know, for two days uh, to all that went on, and then left happy. I don't know why. <laughs> some of them left happy, some of them left colorful, you know. <laughs> What did you talk to them about? What did I talk to them about? Well, let me, we have what, maybe two, three hundred people here right. uh, this evening. I played, uh, oh, I guess the largest I've played was in uh, Central Park to maybe 5,000 people in a, in a um, variety show I was emceeing. I faced 10,000 people in a room, 10,000 people, and I had no prepared material at all. The night before I went on, I thought, what can I tell these people who know the scripts and the characters and the inner motivations far more than I ever did when, when it was fresh and I have no recollection of it. And what can I tell them? And I thought, the only thing they don't know that I know is some of the little things, some of the, how I felt about a particular incident or in my view on a certain thing. So I thought what I'd do is I'd cut through all the malarkey and all the falderall that unfortunately surrounds that show because so many people are making so much money out of the merchandising and the, uh, I tried to cut through all that and I hope I succeeded by just reaching out and saying hey here's what I think and here's what I would like you to understand about something you'd like. We'll be right back with Bill Shatner, Captain Kirk. Right. Captain Kirk. After doing the role of Captain Kirk for three years, <laughs> you really want to continue this streak. Right? <laughs> My great dream to be that logical, unemotional, totally reasonable Vulcan. <laughs> I wonder if he started to identify They tell with me that you part. were an attorney. <laughs> but that wasn't in this in this world. <laughs> oh God! Awful, isn't it? Excuse me for that. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, if you can fill the Americana ballroom with 10,000 10, people, why can't the show come back? I mean, do you, first of all, how do you feel about Star Trek coming back to network television, well, and is it a reasonable possibility? Well, I've been very busy uh, since the cancellation of Star Trek. Uh, I, and it, I really haven't had time for holidays, is how busy I've been. Uh, I bought ski equipment last year and never made use of it, hoping to this year. Um, by the way, I just want wanted to mention that in early March there's a Playhouse 90 that I'm doing called The Tenth Level which on CBS which would be I think very good and a, a film that I'm going into called The Devil's Reign which should be fun but yeah, fine. Uh, well it should be fun to go and see uh, but uh, Star Trek coming back I've heard so many rumors and and so much uh, so, so much has been made of it coming back that has never reached me in concrete terms, that I tend to discard everything now. The possibility exists that it might come back as an hour and a half uh, mini-series. Uh, that's a possibility. But as of this moment, Star Trek uh, is, doesn't look like it is coming back. And it would never, and it would be the first time it ever happened. Would you want to do that? Would you want to be Captain Well, Captain that's again? the question in my mind I haven't solved. I think that, uh, I think that we could fail very badly by being held up by comparison. This is a legendary thing that's happened. People look back and say, God, that's what it was like. Well, it was, it was everyday television back then, and I, I could go on about that, but 
I think we could suffer by comparison if we weren't careful, and that I would want to be very careful uh, not to do. In all TV series, what people see is a one-hour package, but uh, as you said earlier, sometimes it takes uh, uh, 12 hours a day, five or six days a week to get one uh, of those installments. Right. Uh, and there are always mistakes, you know, miscues, bloopers, yes. they call them. Yes, and that's what we call them. <laughs> <laughs> and we've assembled the Star Trek blooper <laughs> so Maybe you can tell us some of the things that well, happened. That we, we thought it was just for us. Well, let me tell you that people have come from Aspen saying, hey, I was in a cafe and I saw you banging against his door. I was interviewed in Tucson. They had the, blo the blooper reel has been pirated all over the place. You know, people are selling it, making a fortune of money on it. And I don't know where it's, where it's happened. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the Star Trek blooper reel. <laughs> let's get right over there. Captain Kirk is human. <laughs> that was the cleaned up version. <laughs> the cleaned up version. <laughs> yes, there is a version that exists. <laughs> well, the decision to make the crew of the Enterprise so multiracial and uh, giving women leading roles, I guess that was kind of unprecedented at the time, wasn't it? It, it was, uh, to a large extent, uh, innovative in many areas, yeah. When you look back on Star Trek, do you have kind of a nostalgic pang in your heart for it? I think of Star Trek much like I think of some other wonderful things that I did in, in love. Um, an actor works on many times on two bases. One, that he works out of love and passion because the, the thing he's working on really satisfies a great many needs and fills them. With money and publicity and billing mean nothing. There are other, thing, other times where the piece isn't so good that all the other extraneous things to what an actor really wants to do come into being. Star Trek was in that first category. You meet very few in a lifetime. Well, thank you very much for being on. I hope that, well, if you want to be Captain Kirk again, then, then that's it. Otherwise, good luck to you. Right, he'll always be Captain Kirk. So, thank you for being on the show. Bill Scott. Coming up next. <laughs> Coming up next, we have what might be an ominous preview of what's ahead for us in the economy and in society, right after this.